Hello, good evening. Good evening, teacher. Good evening. Good evening, teacher. Good evening. Okay, we are going to start with the uh, other session. We are going to begin with the day number eight or session number eight. Yesterday, we were talking about adverbial close of time. That was the last time that we were talking yesterday at the end of the session, because we were talking about how to improve your listening skills also. And now we are going to continue with the topic adverbial close of time. So we are going to um, go to the information that we were reading yesterday. So let's continue with the, this part of the topic. And we have this information here that says what is the uh, adverb class of time and the examples. So we have here, this is the information that we were uh, reading yesterday and now we are going to continue with this point. So it says an adverb uh, class of time shows when something happens, it is usually introduced by time adverbs. Examples before, uh, after, as, when, why, until, as soon as, since, no sooner than, as long as. That's the basic information of this topic or the main information of this topic that is not like a really long uh, topic um, that we are going to develop because this is very simple. So in this case, we are using this kind of adverbs to talk about the time when something happened. So in that case, it's not necessary to um, have a lot of things that say in, in, in this case, because we know that those words uh, function as um, things that we can use to talk about time. So it is not a long, long um, a topic. And now we are going to continue with that part because we have some more information about the uh, adverb uh, clause of time. And then we have, um, a, we have an exercise to uh, know where to use the, um, the adverbs. So after that, we have the examples. It says that we need to, to know something about this kind of uh, topics. And it says that a note that all adverbs They cannot stand on their own and must be attached to an independent clause. So in this case that we are using this kind of a clauses, it says that it is a subordinate and it can function as um, a main sentence. So in this case, we need also um, to have an independent clause because uh, it can function at its own. Para esas cláusulas del de, de tiempo, donde utilizamos los adverbios, um, no podemos utilizarlas como oraciones separadas, sino que siempre tienen que llevar Una oración que les ayude, ¿verdad? En este caso, las cláusulas independientes no pueden funcionar así solas. You are going to show this is the core of this uh, about the adverb clause of time. So, we have some words, some specific words that talk about time. So, in this case, we are going to choose what is the correct one in the sentence. It's a very simple uh, exercise. It's like um, two 
uh, bring into action or to uh, let us know the information that we are saying. So we have some examples in, in this sentence. So let's see. We have the sentence number one and it says, I always take a bath. And we have some space here. I go to bed. And we have the words. Number one is after. And we have when. We have when. Then we have number two. We have number two and it says, will you wait? Will you wait here? And we have the space and I am ready. And we have two options. Number one, uh, in this case, we have um, three options. We have unless, we have until, and we have until. Then we have number three, I was not at home. And we have some space here, he came to see me. So we have the options. We have two options, when and whenever. When and whenever, number four. Do not disturb me. This space. I am busy with my work. And we have the uh, the words that we are going to use. We have until. Then we have if. And then we have when. We have three options for this sentence. Then we have number five. And we have the space at the beginning of the sentence. And it says, she finished, she finished that project. She started working on the next. We're working, uh, she started working on the next. We have three options in this uh, sentence. We have the number one, as soon as. Then we have as long as. And the last one is as far as. Then we have number six. Six, we have again the space at the beginning of the sentence. And it says, I have finished my work. I have finished my work. I will I will accompany you to the park. And we have the options after and afterwards. Then we have number seven. The space again at the beginning of the sentence. I think, I think of her. My eyes 
that misty. And we have the options whenever, ever, and whatever. Then we have number eight. I will start. Face. I am ready. And we have the options. When and whenever. Then we have number nine. We have just nine sentences. So this is the last one. Nine. I will not go. The face I get my money back. Back. And we have the options until, unless, and we have just two options. So now we are going to read the sentence, uh, decide which one is the, the best option for this, um, uh, sentences and then we're going to write the correct answer for each of these sentences that we have here let me like this because we are going to see all of them so you have time to read and choose your correct answer But I have a, a, a question. Uh, you can see the, the screen, all of you can see the screen. Pueden ver la pantalla? Yes, teacher. Yes? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Someone is saying that it has problems with the, the, the session. So that's why I am asking. But now you can read the sentences and we are going to uh, choose the best option. So read, choose, and I will ask for the answers.
Okay, let's see. We are going to answer these uh, sentences. So, in the first one, I always take a bath after or when? When? When, in this case, is when, because we are we can uh, do it after because we are going to sleep. But also, if we can add something to this sentence, we can use before because we can take a bath before we are going to bed. So in this case, is when. Number two, will you wait here unless until until? Until. Until. Until, and the second one, right? This one, until. And we are going to mark the answers. Then number three, I was not at home. He came to see me when or whenever. Pero tengo corazoncito de 14. Number three, when or whenever. When. 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 Okay, in this case, I, I was not at home when he came to see me. No estaba en casa cuando él vino a verme. Number four, do not disturb me. I am busy with my work until if or when. If. When. When, in this case is when. No me molesten cuando estoy ocupada con mi trabajo. When I am busy with my work. Number five, she finished that project. She started working on the next. As soon as, as long as, as far as. As soon as. As soon as. Good, as soon as. Tan pronto como ella terminó ese proyecto, comenzó a trabajar en el siguiente. Good. Number six, I have finished my work. I will accompany you to the park. After or after afterwards. 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 Are you sure? I have finished my work. I will. Okay. I think it's after. Uh -huh. In this case, it's after. After I have finished my work. In this case, después de que he terminado mi trabajo. Termine mi trabajo. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Excellent. Then, number seven. I think of her, my eyes get misty whenever, ever, or whatever. Whenever. 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 When it's about the time. When, cuando, whenever. It's like the, that expression. In this case, cuando sea que pienso en ella. That's uh, that kind of expression. So whenever. H. I will start. I am ready. When or whenever. When. 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 That's good. I will start when I'm ready. Voy a comenzar cuando esté lista. In this case, is a saying, not I will start when I will be ready. In this case, is I will start when I am ready. We are not using the same expression to a part of the sentence because in the first one, we are using the future, but in the second one, we are using the present. But it's uh, talking about that when we are ready, we will start. It, it is not necessary to use the, the future in the, in the two parts of the sentence. Then in the last one, it says, I will not go, I get my money back until unless. Until. Unless. Until, until in this case. So I will until. not go until I get my money back. No me voy a ir hasta que tenga mi dinero de regreso. Okay, that's mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the exercise we have just a nine sentence and we have finished the exercise then it says an adverb clause of time can come before or after the main clause when it comes before the main clause we usually separate it by a comma 
commas are not necessary when the adverb clause go after the main clause. So in this case, we are talking about the order of the clauses. And um, these clauses are the sentence. We have two different sentences in one space. So when the um, this clause, or when we are using the adverbs in this time, we are going to separate because it is before the main uh, clause or the main part of the sentence. And we are going to write a comma to separate them. But in the case that the adverb clause go after the main clause, it is not necessary to separate by a comma. Then it says, if you are talking about something that is yet to happen in the future, Use a present tense in the adverb clause and a future tense in the main clause. This is the thing that we were saying in the uh, sentence number eight. When we are going to talk about something that is yet to happen, que no ha pasado, cuando estamos hablando de algo que va a pasar y que todavía no ha pasado, en el futuro, vamos a utilizar el, el tiempo presente in this kind of uh, clause, that is the adverb clause of time. In la clausula del tiempo, the, the adverb uh, of time, eh, cuando estamos um, usando esa clausula, no vamos a utilizar el futuro. In that case, it is like using the present simple or the present time. And then we are going to use the future tense in the main clause in the number eight, um, we has uh, we have this example because we have two things in that sentence. In the first one, we have I will not go. I will not go. It's something that it's going to happen in the future, and in that case, is the main clause of the sentence. And and we have here the other part of the sentence that is in the present that I was uh, telling you about the, uh, this uh, sentence because we are not, not going to write both parts of the sentence using the future. Just the main sentence will use the future. But the second one, it is not necessary. Así que decíamos, la, um, La estructura general o la principal o la eh, oración principal o la parte principal de la oración sí va a ir en futuro cuando estamos hablando de una acción que no ha pasado todavía y que va a pasar en el futuro. Sí vamos a utilizar el, el will, pero en la otra parte de nuestra oración, que es donde llevamos la cláusula de, eh, del tiempo, no vamos a utilizarlo. No es necesario, solo vamos a utilizar el presente en ese caso. Um, Someone uh, is asking for an example with unless. So uh, we have that the use of unless because uh, someone is saying, uh, saying that we are using uh, the word unless. In that case, unless um, is the same as if not. In este caso, unless, la palabra unless uh, significa lo mismo que if not, si no. Uh, uh, the same case with if, unless it's following by the verb in present. So we are using the, the word unless with uh, some, uh, word, some verbs in present past or past perfect. And we have some example. We are going to use the same sentence with if, and we are going to use the same sentence with unless. So with if, el, 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 la palabra if, que nosotros la conocemos como Si o si, in that case, you will be sick if you don't stop eating. You will be sick if you don't stop eating. Te vas a enfermar si no dejas de comer. And with the unless, we can say, you will be sick unless you stop eating. You will be sick unless you stop eating. Te vas a enfermar si no paras de comer. Unless you stop eating. Te vas a enfermar si no dejas de comer. So in that case, unless um, has the same meaning for if not, si no. But we have some other examples with unless. So then we are going to use or we are going to talk about stress and rhythm uh, 
it when we are talking. So after that, we are going to uh, see the new topic that it is important in the uh, production of the language. So in this case, we are going to talk about uh, how to um, uh, speak. This is uh, something uh, that we are going to, uh, we can say that we are going to enter the topic of uh, speaking. So in this case, we are going to talk about the stress in the words, not the stress that people have because of the word. No, we are going to talk about a stress and rhythm. <laughs> Vamos a hablar del estrés y el ritmo en uh, spoken language, en el idioma, cuando estamos hablando. So, uh, in this case, we have uh, something very interesting to talk about the uh, stress and the rhythm because we are going to um, study some uh, things about this topic that um, will help us not just to understand the topic, but in this case, it help us to improve our pronunciation. Um, en este tema vamos a eh, conocer, ¿verdad?, sobre el estrés y el ritmo, pero también vamos a eh, tomar cosas que nos pueden servir para mejorar nuestra pronunciación when we are um, is, is speaking another language or even in our own language but because sometimes we have different pronunciation or stress or rhythm of the words. So... Beginning with the topic, we have that in second language learning that you are in this process of second language learning to possess a perfect pronunciation. Um, the importance of stress and rhythm should not be ignored. So in this case, in the, in the acquisition of a second language or in the, um, the way to have a perfect pronunciation We need to pay attention to the, stress, to the stress and to the um, the rhythm of the words or the sentence that we are using in this language. So in this case, we have an article. In this case, we are going to explore the information that we have found in an article that is very important because we are going to know how to acquire those skills. So in this article that we are going to uh, study tonight, we are going to talk about the nature of sentence and word stress as well as a rhythm to put in forward uh, some feasible ways of training and acquire a good English stress and rhythm. So in this kind of articles, we are going to find some uh, things that we can use to train uh, the way we are going to talk and produce the words. So the first thing is to uh, read some tips when we are talking. But in that case, it is like the same things that uh, people say about the way we talk because we need to sound more natural and we need to uh, look that we are very um, confident with the words that we're saying. But in this case, it is not talking just the attitude that we present when we are talking in English. In this case, we are talking about something else. That is the pronunciation, the uh, stress and the rhythm that we put in the words. Because we uh, as humans have different ways to express uh, the feelings, the ideas, and all of the things that we want to say to the people. And one of those things that we use to express is the tone of the voice. The way we talk when we want to make some, someone interesting in the topic that we are uh, talking on when we are uh, trying to express something that is very sensible for us, we use a different kind of voice. So in this case, we are going to um, divide those uh, things and we are going to understand what is the importance of uh, stress and rhythm in the spoken language. So it says a speech is a continuous stream of sounds without clear cut bottom lines between them. 
Stress and rhythm are the key to gaining a natural, a small flowing style of speech. People do not speak in separate words, they speak in logical connect group of words. Even native speakers sometimes stumble over the words because they are unaware of the little tricks for avoiding the pitfalls. Thus, the teaching of stress and rhythm should be highly valued. So in this case, it's talking about that people that are native speakers also make mistakes when they are speaking because it's very natural to make mistakes when we are talking. And in this case that we are learning the second language is very, very normal that we make mistakes when we are talking because in, in this case, um, we are not uh, like very familiar with the change of the sounds on off all like that. So in this case, it says that knowing these kind of topics will help us to uh, sound more natural and also to have an, a small uh, a flowing style of a speech because we are going to uh, have this kind of conversation that is very um, natural and fluent and all of that. So, in este caso, estamos hablando, ¿verdad?, de que cuando estamos eh, aprendiendo un segundo idioma necesitamos este tipo de cosas porque eh, a veces solo aprendemos lo, las estructuras y todo eso, pero necesitamos también temas como el ritmo y el estrés de las palabras o de las frases para completar toda esa información que ya tenemos a la hora de hablar. Hacemos un solo consolidado y ponemos en práctica todo lo que sabemos. Then we have the first part. We have sentence stress. This is the first part and it says we have uh, seen that every word of two or more syllables. We are going to talk about two or more syllables. We have seen that every that every word of two or more or more syllables when said alone has a stress on one of its syllables. This is called to express, um, I mean, this is called word stress. Word stress, but in connected speech, in connected speech, we do not hear I stress on every word. Some words lost lose their stresses. Especially when we talk quickly. Other words keep their stresses.
Okay, in this case, we have the synthesis stress. And it says that we have seen that every word of two or more syllables, uh, when said alone, those words with two syllables, it has a stress on one of its syllables. This is called word stress. In that case, that we have just the words and in, when they have two syllables, that we can separate into syllables, one of those uh, separate um, parts of the word has the stress. But in this case, when we are using the connected speech, that is when we are using all those words in one sentence or in a conversation, we do not hear the stress in every word. Because in that case, if we are uh, paying attention just on the stress of the words, we are going to talk very slow because we are going to pay a lot of attention to that uh, sounds. And in this case, when we are talking, we are just making them uh, be fluent in our mouth. So in this case, we can uh, hear all these stresses of the words because we are uh, using all of them in a sentence. Then uh, some words lose their stresses, especially when we talk quickly. In this case, when we are talking uh, fast or quickly, the stress is not very important in that moment because we are just talking. And when we are talking quickly, uh, we can make that uh, changes of the of the uh, pronunciation of the words. Other words keep their stress syllables, and these stress syllables form what it's called descendant stress. So it is very common to uh, see this kind of word because in the spoken language, it's very different when we are uh, talking with someone that we feel uh, comfortable to talk or when we are um, being more formal with the people that we are talking. So in those cases, we can uh, use a different um, kind of pronunciation of the words. And in some cases, we can uh, find the, uh, the stresses on the words, but in some cases, it is not very uh, easy to understand the stresses or where the stresses are, because we are just uh, talking and trying to explain our point of view or something that we are going to say. En esta parte estamos hablando de el estrés, de las oraciones que tienen estrés. Dice que todas las palabras que tienen dos eh, sílabas, siempre va a haber, eh, como el estrés siempre va a recaer en una de las sílabas. Pero en este caso, cuando estamos utilizando todas estas palabras en una sola conversación y estamos hablando rápido, no vamos a notar esos cambios, esas variaciones en las palabras. Eh, estamos utilizándolas todas en una sola, eh, en un solo espacio. And we are not paying attention to the, um, the way we are talking. But in some cases, some of these words eh, will keep their stresses and we are going to understand where is the stress. That's very simple. Then, what is the function of this kind of stress uh, or sentence stress? Let's see. We are talking, uh, we are going to talk about the, the function of this stress in the sentences. So let's see. Function of a stress sentence or sentence stress. So it says, this uh, sentence stress has two functions. So we are going to see two functions. It has two functions. And the first one, it says, it's to indicate, first one is to indicate the important words in the sentence. It said that uh, from the point of view of grammar, meaning of the meaning or the speaker's attitude. In this case, we have the number one. It's to indicate the important words in the sentence. Where uh, we are going to use the stress or sentences stress to indicate 
the important words in the sentence. Why, uh, what are the, the most important words in the sentence? And it says from the point of view of grammar, the meaning of the sentence or the speaker's attitude are the most important things in the sentence. And we have, for example, I could hardly believe my eyes. I could hardly believe my eyes. I could hardly believe my eyes. In that sentence, we have the stress because um, have some important points because we can uh, believe something that we are saying. So in that cases, we are using the stress to make that sound um, very, uh, uh, that people can understand that we are not believing what we are saying. In this case, it, it says in this sentence, the word hardly believe and eyes are stressed because they are important in meaning because we are using the meaning. So let's write the sentence I write here. I call and we are going to add this symbol to mark uh, the stress hardly. Believe, again, we are going to mark, believe, my, and we are going to mark eyes. Those symbols that we are writing at the beginning of the word, it let us know that those words have a stress. So in this case, we are going to see the explanation again. Hardly believe in eyes are stressed because they are important in meaning. What does this mean? Meaning, what are they important to meaning? Because we are saying that we don't believe something that is happening. So in that case, the meaning is that we are not sure and we are uh, feeling something like surprise or something like that. Estamos diciendo que tiene eh, la primera función es que nos da una parte importante de la oración. En este caso, dice que en gramática puede ser el significado o puede ser la actitud del que habla. Nos va a mostrar esas dos cosas con la primera parte del estrés. En esta oración, I could hardly believe my eyes, nos está diciendo que se está poniendo el estrés en hardly believe in eyes, porque son palabras importantes para el significado de la oración. El significado de esta oración es, I could hardly believe my eyes, es, no puedo o casi no puedo eh, creer mis ojos. En in, in this case, you're talking about the eyes. No puedo creer lo que está pasando. I am very surprised. Estoy muy sorprendido y no puedo comprender lo que está pasando. So in that case, those words, have the stress because they are talking about the meaning. They are important for the meaning of the expression. Then we have the second function. And it says, is to serve. We are, we are going to add here second function because it's very, okay. Second function is to serve. It's to serve as the basis. Of the rhythmical. Of the rhythmical structure. Chemical structure of the sentence. The rhythm of English speech is formed by the recurrence of stress syllables at more or less irregular intervals of time and by the alteration of stress and unstressed syllables. Under the influence of a latter peculiarity of the rhythm of English speech, important words in meaning which are usually stressed may be pronounced 
without sentence stress. So in this case, it's saying that the second function of the stress of the words is to serve as the basis of the rhythmical structure of the sentence. En la segunda parte estamos viendo que sirve como la base para la estructura rítmica de las oraciones. And it says that um, under the influence of the latter peculiarity of the written Omega speech, important words in meaning, which are usually stressed, stress may be pronounced without sentence stress. We have some words that are important for the meaning of the sentence, but it says that in some cases, we can uh, pronounce the stress of the words. Dice que estas palabras que son importantes para el significado a veces no se dicen con el eh, sentence stress, sino que simplemente las utilizamos para marcar el ritmo. We have a, an example, very good. And we have the pronunciation, very good. Bad, well, we have not very good, not very good. We have, um, uh, we are marking in the time. And uh, when we have, uh, for example, uh, people that is um, learning English for the first time of um, people that is from other countries, it's very common to um, hear the stress on the words that they are using. Um, because it's, we are creating something, right? And when we see someone, that is learning English for the first time, they uh, use uh, um, the same uh, way to speak. And when they when they are reading something, some text in English, they uh, don't use the, modul the modulation in tone. So it's very uh, common at the beginning of the this, uh, process to talk without the, um, the written and the stress of the words because we are using the, the voice to express something. Eh, se dice que cuando hay personas de diferentes países aprendiendo un idioma, whatever the language it is, um, they don't use this stress in the pronunciation or intonation or whatever eh, um, words we are using. No utilizamos esto, ¿verdad? Vamos de manera plana, con un solo ritmo. Y no vamos cambiando, because we need to uh, be very familiar with the uh, sentence or the expression of the words. And it's very common, and it is the first part of, this, of the beginning or this process. So, we have some suggestions to help people to um, grasp the sentence stress. The first one is, too improper to accent all the content words in a word group, regardless of the contextual situation. Also, they are more likely to receive accent than the grammatical form of the words. Only the telegram words or the words you will wish a somewhat a deaf person to hear should be accent. In this case, mm -hmm. uh, when we are talking, it's um, one of the suggestion is to stress just those words that we want to mark. Uh, maybe in this case, we can uh, say that we are going to use the stress in those words that we need to put the, um, the uh, strong uh, pronunciation because it means something that we need people to understand. Then um, to supply a uh, in this case, students with enough opportunities to decide which words should be stressed in a sentence by themselves. In this case, you have to choose which words you want to stress in a sentence. Because we are uh, reading that all the sentence that have two syllables have the stress in one of the two syllables. In this case, when we are talking, we can choose in which words we need the stress. We need to put the F word and we need to put the strong part of the voice. So, esta, esta es una sugerencia que se le hace, ¿verdad? A los que están estudiando eh, inglés o algún otro idioma. 
que se les permita decidir en qué parte de la oración queremos ponerle el estrés a las palabras. Ahí es donde marcamos cuáles son las palabras más importantes para nosotros y ahí vamos creando nuestro ritmo a la hora de hablar. Then, uh, in some cases, the teacher should read text loudly. Uh, when the teacher is reading or playing the tape, the students how to look at the text. The teacher should direct students to pay attention to the lowering, rising, loudness, pause, as lowering sounds. This is very important because we are going to create the flow of the pronunciation of the words. In some cases, when we are learning, we have someone that help us to learn. And in this case, we are going to use this figure as the teacher. And in some cases, the teacher can uh, have some exercises for the students or the participants of a course. So in that case, the teacher or the person that is in control of the course can do some exercises with uh, these participants. And in this case, the person is going to read a, a, a text. Then the students have to follow the, the way the teacher is reading. Or maybe we can use audios of different kind of peoples on, and different kind of accents. And we can pay attention to the, uh, the lowering, the raising, the uh, loudness, pause, and the showing and uh, slowing of sounds. And it's very important because we can make that way, like it's up, down, and all of that. Es un ejercicio muy bueno este de eh, que una persona que esté a cargo lea un texto y que los demás vayan leyendo tratando de pronunciar de, de la misma manera las palabras, poniendo atención en donde sube, baja, se nivela, vuelve a subir, vuelve a bajar, se pausa o se pone más lentas las palabras porque así vamos a crear nuestra eh, propia manera de hablar y vamos a crear nuestro ritmo. So, we have, in this uh, first thing, we have the stress sentence and then In the last part, we have the word stress. This is the, uh, just the words. And it says words which are usually expressed in English on an emphatic speech belong to content words. Um, it says namely nouns, adjectives, numerals, notional verbs, adverb, demonstrative, interrogative, indefinite pronouns and possessive pronouns functioning as nouns. And those that are usually unexpressed in English um, are form uh, words, namely auxiliary and modal verbs, verbs to be monosyllabic, preposition, monosyllabic conjunctions and articles, personal pronouns, possessive pronouns, except absolute ones like mine or hers, Reflexive pronouns, reciprocal pronouns, and relative pronouns are also, uh, are also usually in a stress. So in this case, we have to uh, list the words that are stressed and the words that are on stress. Tenemos dos partes o dos listas de palabras que sí van con estrés y palabras que no llevan este estrés. En la primera parte, las eh, palabras que sí llevan estrés, in this case, are words like name, or in this case, adjectives also have a stress, numerals, notional verbs, adverbs also have a stress, demonstrative, interrogative, indefinite pronouns also have a stress and possessive pronouns. In este caso tenemos los adverbios, los eh, demonstrativos, interrogativos, o pronombres indefinidos también tienen su estrés. Eh, in this case, also the possessive pronouns also have stress. And some of these uh, words are on stress. La otra lista de los on stress pueden ser eh, auxiliary words or auxiliary verbs. Those auxiliary verbs doesn't have uh, the stress. 
Also, modal verbs uh, don't have a stress. We have a monosyllabic prepositions, monosyllabic conjunctions, and articles. Articles are not a stress. Personal pronouns, and some of the possessive pronouns also don't have the stress. So we have some examples. I am a reading, I am a reading a very interesting novel. Dress yourself more neatly. However, it is necessary to point out that any word in a sentence may be logically stressed if it implies a special emphasis or contrast. Tenemos estas palabras que pueden ser, eh, pueden llevar estrés o no, pero siempre tenemos una excepción a la regla. In this case, eh, cuando vamos a eh, hacer un énfasis o un contraste o ponerle una especial atención a una palabra, la podemos llegar a estresar o ponerle un estrés porque estamos haciendo énfasis en esa palabra. But in some cases, it is not necessary to uh, have the stress on the words. So, in this case, we are going to end uh, this session today with the, this topic about the stress and rhythm. And we are going to continue with another topic. Um, yes, thank you, Sandra. And tomorrow we are going to continue with another topic that we are going to develop um, tomorrow. But now it's time to say goodbye. Have a good night and see you tomorrow in the next session. Good night. See you tomorrow. Good night. See you tomorrow. Good night. Thank you. See you tomorrow, teacher. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.